Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, proceed with the next presentation. We have uh, Maria Hernick with uh, the European Space Agency here with us uh, remotely, connecting from the Netherlands. Maria, you're good to go whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Shana. So good morning uh, to you all. Or actually, as Jennifer said, I would say good afternoon. As here in Europe, you are about six hours ahead of you. So my name is Maria Hanek, and you see the picture there. That's how I look like. And I'm sure that I have met some of you sitting there in the audience. And I'm just sorry that I can't be with you there today. I'm heading the flight software system section, the technical director at the, our European Space Agency. And in this role, I'm also responsible for the independent software verification validation process and uh, the process improvement activities. So my presentation today will report on some of those findings from an activity we launched uh, to learn more about the module-based testing. So we'll first start with a, a brief introduction on, um, on uh, uh, the ESA ISV process to allow you to get an understanding on how we at ESA are carrying out that independent software verification and validation. And after that, I will focus on this study that uh, um, we applied the model-based testing method. I will look at the approach and what we actually tested and some of those achievements that we got. So this study activity, this model-based testing of the flight software, it's still um, ongoing. So some of the findings we will actually uh, keep in mind for uh, the final results that we are yet to come. So ISV at ESA, uh, it's actually required by all uh, mission and safety critical software and is stipulated by our um, ECSS standard. The, uh, the process itself, it is uh, defined um, so that all the ISV activities are complementary to the nominal software development and that VNV that is watching in that software uh, normal life cycle. The, um, the ESA ISV process as such, I mean, it's not a surprise to you to hear that that covers the verification validation of the software requirements to design the code and test. And typically we start that ISV process as the software SRR or PDR, and we end it just before the software QR. But, but it's in, important to keep in mind here is that the boundary for the ICD process is the software supplier's artifacts, so whatever the software suppliers such are generating. So we are, in a way, uh, executing ICD with that possible force assumption that the input for that software development, uh, the level two specification, but that is a complete, uh, correct and consistent um, artifact. So I would say perfect view. That is probably not true, but we have to start somewhere. What is a bit different compared to your world over there is that in Europe you are performing the ISVV as an uh, independent contract. So the ISVV supplier, as we call them, they are an independent organization from the uh, um, mission prime or so. And nominally we set up a dedicated industrial contract uh, within that uh, uh, mission context. And in Europe, I think today we have somewhere between five and eight different candidates for such uh, contracts. So it could well be that one supplier are performing, uh, one ISV supplier are performing uh, several ISV activities for different missions. Just a brief uh, view on how that process looks like that we are responsible for here. Um, they have six stages that you see here on the picture. Uh, two management steps, one for that typical project management, and then we have one uh, stage that is dedicated to uh, uh, analyze the ISVD level definition. Maria? Yes. Um, we are not seeing the same slides you're seeing, I don't think. Have you been advancing them in the Adobe Connect session? Which, which slide number are you on? I'll make sure I um, advance. I'm on number four. Okay. So, what should I think or what should I do? Um, 
I think I've got it now. Yeah, that one. Okay. Yeah. Before, should I okay. continue to switch pages or will you do that for me? I'll do it for you if you just tell me next slide. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, so the current, uh, uh, the slide you see there, it's the, um, just the six pages that we have on the ICV process. Um, the uh, stages we have for the uh, ISCB engineering activities, you can see that that fairly mirrors the software development phases and uh, whatever uh, artifacts that the software supplier are, are producing. And then uh, whatever complementary verification activities, those are defined for that technical specification, the design uh, documentation as well as the source code. So whatever the, the process definition that we have set up, it's structured in such a way that the, the general objective are for the ICD supplier, it's, it's defined within each of those industrial contracts that I mentioned before. But the ICD supplier has the freedom to select the methods that they want to use to carry out those objectives. So that's uh, why we are interested in looking at different methods to actually solve the analysis problem or uh, the verification validation activities. So that's our main focus for this. So that model-based testing that we have looked at here, it, it could for us, it could contribute into that last stage, the uh, independent validation. And validation in our world here at ESA is uh, testing. So uh, the validation activities that we expect from uh, supplier is uh, uh, that they write the specifications based on analysis, of course, and that they analyze, that they uh, create test uh, procedures, so to say, to execute the test and then to analyze the um, produced results. See if I change the slides now. Do you see that or? Okay. Well, it would have been fine if I hadn't clicked too, I think. Sorry? I think you're good. Go ahead. Okay, good. Um, just a little bit more background on how, what you can find in our process uh, definition for the ICD. Um, here we just see a quick um, panel of the task description for that technical specification analysis, if say so. Uh, you can just briefly see the input that we expect for the task and uh, that we actually have 11 different subtasks in there. You only see three of them actually on the page, so I don't think that you can actually see them, it's so small. Uh, and you can also see that we have some expected outputs like uh, um, ICD reports and uh, any contribution to any validation tasks. In total, our uh, ISVV process, it consists of 70 uh, engineering subtasks, and that's quite an impressive number, I would say. Uh, however, when you do that first uh, uh, contract, as I, as I spoke about, uh, we can discope or scope uh, the ISVV activities that we are interested in, so we can make a dedicated tailoring for each and every of the missions. Typically, I would say that the uh, requirements verification that's applicable to all of them, and most likely the code analysis as well. But the design analysis could be something that you tailor depending on what type of mission you have. For instance, if you have a lot of reuse software, or um, if you have components, cost components in your software, it might not be so uh, of high interest to do the design analysis. So the way that our process is defined, it gives you the flexibility to tailor it. So now we're on uh, page six. And this is just to give you uh, the starting point that I mentioned before on that requirements verification. Um, it also includes the operational and the data handling requirements. Of course, so uh, whatever uh, operator uh, inputs that are needed. And then we focus in on uh, why we are looking at that model based testing uh, for the validation, independent validation. Um, what we are looking at there and the inputs that we use for that uh, activity are things well, everything you have on the uh, 
on the left side. So uh, uh, the requirements baseline and all of the artifacts that are listed here. We use them as input into the identification of uh, test cases. Um, we also use the um, knowledge about the validation facility when we construct the test procedures. And we also use the validation facility for the execution of that uh, uh, test procedures. This uh, validation facility, that could be anything. It could be a simulator, it could be an emulator, and it could even be a hardware in the loop in our cases. So um, a bit of background for the uh, for that model-based testing. What actually triggered that idea to to look at it in more detail? I think that we all know that uh, all institutes, all organizations all over the world, they are in some way they are looking at software development uh, with model-based techniques. And we are these, so we are not so far behind, even if we might be a bit far behind. Uh, we have experience on based design and in principle we, we have a, a tool that we call PASTE where we have a tool chain where we can uh, hook on various uh, uh, development platforms and where the model based is one component. So in this study we wanted to focus on the validation aspect as we already mentioned and uh, um, to apply a method on a flight software. So we are not going to invent the method itself. We take a method that is already out there, but we want to see how that works in our context. And why do we do that? Yes, the, the validation as such is something we know that it always ends up on the critical path. So we are interested in to, uh, to uh, improve that efficiency during the validation phase. And of course, one way to do that could be to introduce more uh, automation during that validation. Uh, phase activity. And uh, the picture here, although it's not uh, uh, the best design in my life, uh, I would say uh, that I just tried to introduce a bit of the uh, vocabulary that we have when it comes to uh, uh, test and validation. The test object as such, um, it's, uh, it resides in that software verification facility, the SVF. And as I said before, that could be a simulator, that could be an emulator, that could be a breadboard of the hardware. And that, uh, whoops, what happened now? That uh, uh, SVS is stimulated by uh, telecommands that are generated from the ground segment simulator. And uh, that behavior of, uh, of the platform that we reside on is, is uh, simulated by, uh, by the sim ops. So we can have test libraries uh, to simulate the various equipments on the platform like uh, uh, actuator sensors. Uh, we can generate test scripts that we load into the sim ops. And most of this will be possible to be observed through the TM, the telemetry that goes down to the ground operator again. So this is the, the dictionary uh, nomenclature that we are using here just to uh, give you a bit of an intro. I assume that you have uh, similar, that you're used to similar nomenclature on your side. So the method that we looked at and we were interested in here then uh, is the, what we call a sequence-based specification and we combine that with a statistical-based uh, testing. And the sequence-based specification that's uh, developed as a black box principle, I'm sure that some of you in the audience, you are uh, experts on this, uh, uh, with the principle just to apply a, a method that is already out there. But uh, this sequence-based specification, so it's a black box principle, and uh, one of the challenges when we do that uh, uh, formulation is actually to, uh, to define the system boundaries. And uh, whatever uh, the external stimuli there is defined as a response of that black box, so the response to the external stimuli. 
And whenever we have created that specification, uh, we get the output as a macro chain or similar something that is well structured. Uh, we can then generate uh, test values based on that on, on, a, on a profile, and that profile could be a, a probabilistic profile that could be useful in some cases. We'll come back to that profile in a week later on. So. I change slide again. Uh, I hope you see that. Should be on number 10 now. And then you can see how does this approach with a, a statistical based uh, um, testing and that sequence based application, how does that fit with our software validation aspect? So just bring up that uh, uh, picture again. And everything that I have dotted in red here uh, is something that could be generated out of that. Uh, sequence. So um, there is potential for the uh, automation that I was talking about, about before that could actually help us become more efficient. Today, those uh, those activities are actually manually generated in our area, and that is of course uh, very labor intensive. So our test object that we were looking at um, here in this study, we used the flight software from a mission that is not yet launched, but it will be launched uh, within a year or two. So that flight software, it should be close to perfect. It's gone through uh, all the verification and validation that is deployed. And the, you can uh, see all the listed functions there that uh, that flight software has all the nominal functions that you expect from a central computer. So we have the thermal control, the power control, the UCS, any uh, telemetry memory management, any mass memory uh, uh, management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when we look at that function, at say a sequence-based specification, uh, whatever is is but it should be targeted, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we selected it. it. It should be well suited for whatever state machines and complex combination of input sequences, and especially that last part was what uh, was um, interesting for us here. Some more statistics on that flight software, so you understand that that is not a, a small piece of software. It actually is in total about 1,400 requirements that are, are uh, encapsulated from the beginning. Uh, when we went through it and looked at what could actually be uh, um, modeled with this SPS method, um, we came down to uh, 224 requirements, 225 requirements that seems to be relevant, and those ones were then selected to go through the SPS. And of course, I will come back later to which functions that are actually part in that 225. So just a brief steps of that sequence-based specification. Um, it goes through this study, it goes through all the, the steps here, and uh, we do that to reach that test model that you see on the on the bottom of the picture. The test model is then the source of the test scripts uh, and the stimuli and the test libraries, of course, that you saw there earlier on the on the slide. And we start from that requirement that is today uh, expressed in a natural language. Um, the natural language English, as we call it, or European English. Uh, while some of them are, of course, some, some uh, control functions like the AUCS that's more described as algorithm. I think that is a uh, common view for all of you. So um, the first step there is then to convert it into that sequence-based specification. And SPS is a formal specification with a, with a syntax, so then it could be uh, converted into the Mealy machine or the Markov chain uh, usage model. And uh, uh, to my understanding, that Mealy machine, that's a um, finite state machine, where the, the output of that is determined by the current state and the current input. 
then in the step from that Mealy machine to that test model, the annotated Mealy machine here, that's where we, we apply the probability factors. So our goal for this study was to, to find bugs in the system, so we applied uh, equal probability to every arc. Uh, we would actually be able to cover all the arcs and all the requirements would then be tested for its, its nominal function. I mean, you can apply that, uh, that annotated, um, if we call it the, uh, the, the annotated factors, in such a way that you focus on, on uh, critical functions or you aim for robustness. And that's uh, typically an, uh, something that I think could be interesting for, for a future study for us. But you see here also, uh, go back to the first presentation today, throughout all those steps we have a clear uh, traceability on from the requirements and down to the generation of tests. And uh, um, that is one of the strengths with this uh, method. And I don't know what happened when my screen started to uh, which slide do you want? I'm on the 14. Okay, that's what we see here. You see it? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so we in the steps to create that sequence-based specification uh, where we translate that textual uh, requirements into that formal-based specification. So we start up there by identifying that the boundaries and uh, where you can look at the system as a black box with uh, just a list of users, the interfaces. And those users, they could be either hardware or a software subsystem, so this is the way on how you can actually split down your system. And the users, they, they send the external stimuli across the system boundary and they receive some responses uh, back through the boundary. In our case, um, uh, the stimuli is typically um, telecommands, I would say. So that's where we identify in the, in the second step. And we also, together with that stimuli, we, we identify what type of telecommands. So if that is a mode change, if it's a, a power on, or if it's power off, or, or updated time, or whatever type of telecommands in the And then the uh, next step is then to identify all the responses to this. So how is that system um, behavior observable from the outside? What are the responses that we can get from all the stimuli? Whatever the mood is changed, the, the heating is on, etc. Then uh, what makes that uh, in the formal part of or, or put in the formalist into that specification is when we start to enumerate all that sequences of, of stimuli. And uh, that's where the, um, you walk through all that stimuli that we identified and you form a sequence in that. So uh, you add the, the, uh, the sequences to each other, you attach them, and then uh, any one of them that becomes illegal, you take them out. Uh, or you take out those that has already been built, and by that you would create the formalism in the in the chain. And you you continue to do that to expand all that uh, until you don't see any more of the variants in that sequence. And then uh, as part of that, you also identify what they call the canonical sequence, which is the end result of all that animated sequence. And that's where we kept, where the uh, where the where the, uh, the method gives us the maximum length of the uh, the sequence. That's the state of that milli machine. And then um, we use that to define uh, and define values to that canonical sequence. When we reach that, that's where we can generate the milli machine. As you understand, um, there is, I'll come to, uh, to a bit of the uh, tool support later on. So I just uh, uh, describe a bit of that statistical-based testing, which will 
which is a combination here with the SPS. So we apply on that um, use that annotated test model and to, to generate the test cases. So that's what the directed graphs are, um, where we actually use this state that I mentioned before, and uh, they are connected to the arcs. And the usage event is done, the, uh, the external stimuli. So, uh, in principle, the, uh, the telecommand transfer um, that is sent to the flight software. So, what I said before, that objective, when, when you create a test case, the coverage goal is to cover all the arcs of that chain at least once. And that would, as a result, cover all the requirements that were implemented in the, uh, in the sequence based specification and gives the nominal uh, operation of the whole system. For that test case generation, we, we used uh, uh, a tool support, which is called the Jumble, which was a Java-based uh, structure. And we also had uh, tool support for uh, mapping that stimuli to the test script library, which was the Convac T. I think the tool support is fundamental for applying a method like that because we're not really interested in, from my view, I would say, we're not interested in to um, develop the tools as such. We are, in, we are interested in to see how the tool chain can actually make our validation activities more efficient. But of course, depending on what, what type of validation environment you have, I mentioned that we have the software verification facility and the, the theme ops around that. So depending on what environment you have there, uh, the test code that you generate out of the, the test cases there, they have to be on that language that uh, can be interpreted by your facility. So in our case, uh, we have um, facility, we have our uh, our test equipment that can uh, be run with uh, any standard test scripts like Java or Python, and that's what the tools are supporting. So whenever you uh, have a standard like that, it should be rather straightforward for your users. So going back to that test case uh, criteria, or test case generation, as I said, you can apply a, a probability profile on that depending on your objectives with your testing. Um, in our first case, we, we applied just uh, the same weight on all of it just because we wanted to see uh, the, um, how to apply the method through the tools to get uh, the, uh, the first result out of, out of that. But I can also see that this is the part where uh, typically the IDNV could benefit from if you have uh, specific areas of your software that you're interested in and um, have, uh, apply a, a weighted um, profile um, that could help you when you generate your test cases. So here is something, it's, it's an area where I think we have uh, potential for the future and that's where we want to continue to look at as well. Just to mention some of the tools that we were using, um, the SPS Super is based on something that is called Protosec and that Protosec um, is also what I understand uh, developed by the University of Tennessee. The Protosec um, or the SPS Super that was used here is, is, uh, is based on the Protosec, but there were some uh, um, areas where they wanted to improve it, so that's where they built uh, uh, top on there. Um, in principle, it's a number of, of uh, panels or, uh, or uh, sheets that you fill out and uh, you actually you, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very formal panel structure to walk through. And it's more the uh, how they are connected um, that is, of course, the most important. Again here, uh, the traceability is an aspect that I want to point out that was very strong uh, through that tool support. And that's something that is very important for us. So 
but just to give you some uh, characteristics on what we actually implemented. So we looked at uh, six different functions, thermal control, the power control, AUCS mood manage, uh, um, mass memory handling, and uh, RTU managers, in this case it's a separate unit, and the onboard timing in the platform. And you can see on the uh, um, there was simpler and complex response, and that type that refers to the number of stimuli and the, the predicate responses and their possible combination. Again, the, the stimuli is the uh, input command message to the model system. Uh, while the predicate here, we use that uh, as uh, similar to the stimuli, but actually we express it, we use it to express the use of the data pool for the function. But the data pool could have various values. Um, in total, we had about uh, 1,000 sequences that were, were created. And uh, that will give you a bit of indication on how many test cases we hopefully will have uh, when we see the, the final result of that. Of course, I mean, we were interested in the effectiveness of the, uh, of the work itself. So how much time do you actually have to spend on this modeling? And to my, or to our very surprise, I mean, I said we, we created uh, more than 1,000 sequences. While we didn't spend uh, especially many hours on this. Um, so the, um, the team that did this modeling, they, uh, uh, they are experts on the modeling itself, but they have very little knowledge about spacecraft systems. So they used the time within the parentheses to understand the domain for the spacecraft system and such. And whenever they did understand that, they increased the speed on the modeling. So looking at those figures, it, the, the method itself is quite interesting and uh, looks very uh, attractive. There were a few discrepancies found, uh, not as many as we expected. It could be because it was a quite mature system already that we started with. Just to, uh, to conclude, I think I have minus 10 seconds, something like that. Uh, the first, we did expect that we would uh, found uh, uh, issues related to completeness and consistency. You do that when you translate uh, English-based or natural language-based uh, uh, specification to a formal language. We didn't find many here, and that maybe that's only because it was a good input from the beginning. What you were forced to use in this method was the testability, and that we see as, as a strength. Uh, Sometimes we tend to forget that when we do the requirement specification, and here you're really forced to, uh, to apply that testability. Traceability, I already mentioned, that is really a strength in this system, in this method. And uh, especially for us, where we are having uh, software versioning as a, as, a, as a standard in our uh, industry today, we get new versions of the software all the time. It's a, it's a strength to have that traceability in place, and you can see what has actually changed in the versions you are, you are delivering. However, there are weaknesses because it's only a few percentage or 40% uh, uh, of the system that is, is uh, possible to, to uh, model with this um, technique. So the data handling, for instance, is not possible to model, or it it hasn't been modeled here uh, because you look at structures of protocol, etc., and the, the method itself is not really fit for that. There is potential in this. Um, as I said before, the automation is there, and um, we want to look further into that profiling of the annotator and testing to see if that can bring us something in the future. I do apologize, I'm uh, two minutes over the time now. That's okay, we'll uh, go ahead and send you my over. presentation. Thank you, Maria. We'll send you over to the breakout session to entertain questions. Okay. Thank you.